tonight on Inventing the Future, we're taking a close look at the collision between open society and surveillance. With guests Bruce Schneier and Julian Sanchez, stay tuned for What's Next after What's Next. One hundred thousand BC, stone tools. Four thousand BC, the wheel. Ninth century AD, gunpowder. Nineteenth century, Eureka, the light bulb. Twentieth century, the automobile, television, nuclear weapons. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. Everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you, and you can change it. You can influence it. You can you can build your own things that other people can use. People want their technology to have a sense of humanity. They want it to understand me, you specifically. We have three billion new minds coming online to work with us to solve the grand challenges. The rate at which the technology is getting faster is itself getting faster to a point that we have the potential to create a world of abundance. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to be back here tonight with Inventing the Future. You know, tonight's show is a little bit different than our usual show. Uh, usually I come out and I talk about technologies that get me really excited, things that are coming in the future that I think hold great promise. Uh, tonight it's going to be a rather different perspective because it turns out that the digital technologies that so delight us and brought us so much abundance in terms of information and new ways to communicate, new ways to share ideas, well, those technologies also have a dark side to them. And we're going to take a look at that tonight. Uh, it turns out that these technologies that are in use around us right now. Um, for instance, you're probably familiar with the idea of a, of a hacker who might be going after your password to your social network account or maybe your credit card information or something like that. Um, but it turns out that they have a, a convention uh, in Las Vegas, yes, just like any organization, the, the, the Black Hat Conference. And in, in 2011, just a couple years ago, one of, the, uh, one of these hackers presented a paper uh, where he proved that he can actually wirelessly hack into an insulin pump or a, um, uh, a, um, uh, a heart um, meter and uh, actually hack it from a distance. In a way, uh, he could send a jolt to that person and commit the perfect crime by killing him in a way that would be totally undetectable. Uh, that's a scary thought. And some of the manufacturers are already working on cloaking technologies uh, to prevent that from happening. Uh, just last week, the National Intelligence Estimate was published and this is a document that details how China has a massive sustained campaign underway right now to hack into multinational corporations. And as it turns out, more than 50 corporations are under almost constant assault in this way. Um, more, more than 50 co corporations per week are hacked into, and an average of almost two times a week, their uh, internet defenses are successfully penetrated. So this is a real present threat that's happening. Uh, and it's not just uh, these the, the, you know, overseas threats that are happening. This technology is starting to pervade our life. It's becoming actually scarily commonplace. Uh, there are already corp uh, companies, retailers, that are experimenting with cameras that will track you as you walk into the store, and they'll compare your, uh, your face to faces that have, face images that have been tagged on Facebook, this facial recognition technology that's so prevalent, not just on Facebook, but also Apple and Google and other companies have, have promoted uh, and that's not all. Some companies are starting to use this uh, in a way that I feel is almost unfair, where in a job interview situation, a corporation may demand that you relinquish your uh, Facebook credentials or your Twitter account so that they can get a better understanding of your habits and how you communicate and who you're connected to. And that's a little bit Orwellian, I think. Um, and perhaps cre most creepy of all, just this last week, Raytheon, a major defense contractor, announced a new program called Riot. It's the Rapid Information Overlay Technology. Uh, what this allows them to do is assess in massive scale people's behavior in social networks so that they can predict future behavior. And this starts to take on a kind of creepy sci-fi uh, theme. Now, some people feel that privacy is over. Uh, just a decade ago, the CEO of Sun Microsystems, Scott McNeely, said this. He said, you have zero privacy anyway, so folks, get over it. 
That's the world that he envisioned. We want to hear from you. We'd like to know what you think about this issue. And you can certainly use the hashtag ITF to let us know. Uh, I noticed that some people before the show have already started to send in questions on Facebook. And on live stream, you can chat in and offer your questions and comments as well. After tonight's show, we're going to stick around a little while for some live Q&A with the audience about this. Uh, but first, what I want to do is introduce our experts. We have two fantastic guests for you tonight. And first, let's bring on stage one of the most renowned security experts in the world, Bruce Schneier. Bruce, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. So, you are well known as a kind of a pundit about security and, uh, and the issues that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, and your services are also in high demand with organizations all over the world. Um, what people might not know is that you have a fantastic newsletter they can sign up for. It's where I learn about these issues, and I've been following it for quite a while. And Bruce also recently published this book, Liars and Outliers. Tell me a little bit about this book. Is this on this to topic? or? Well, it, it is in sort of a meta way. What I'm looking at is the notion of why security exists, and I'm looking at trust. And really, if you think about society, we need trust to make it work. Yeah, I mean, you've got this audience here, and... Uh, and I'm looking at them, and not one of them has jumped up and attacked the person sitting next to them. Right, you laugh, but if that was an audience full of chimpanzees, <laughs> we couldn't get away with it. Right? Humans are the only species that can sit there quietly. And society works because of this. And there's a whole bunch of reasons. Right? One of them might want to mug the other person or you know, steal my iPad back in the uh, dressing room. But they don't for a whole bunch of reasons. There's right. a lot of security there. And, so and we have sort of a social construct that keeps us all looking out for each other. It's social, legal, there's a lot of right. things going on there. So the nature of, uh, the nature of society in, requires some measure of trust to function. Um, but in some respect, this might be getting undermined. For instance, this topic of hackers, it keeps coming up. People are very familiar with it. Um, but from what I've read, you think it's kind of an overblown idea. Sometimes it's overhyped. Well, we, te we do tend to overhype uh, the criminal threats. And you know, it's really what makes headlines what sells newspapers. We, t we like to hype the attacks from China, cyber terrorism, yeah, cyber true. war. Uh, basic cyber crime, I mean, stealing money, I think, is, is underreported. Okay, now, yeah, I mean, a lot more happens. Some people have said the news. That, that accounts for almost uh, two-thirds of all crime is now Internet crime. Uh, I don't know if that, if that number is accurate, but I've heard that. Yeah, it, it's really hard to count. It's hard to measure. I mean, That's but right. There's certainly a lot of it. Uh, okay, and so, I, and it's, it's so we can't dismiss it. It's a real thing. But tonight we're going to cover a number of threats. I thought we'd start, though, with a funny idea here. So a hacker in Montana hacked into a, uh, a local TV station, and he got into the emergency alert system there. Uh, and he sent out the message that the zombies are, are attacking right now. So sometimes it's uh, malicious hacking, sometimes it's just for fun, it's like a prank. Uh, and we've seen many examples of that. Um, one thing you might not know is the prevalence of this, how often this is happening. So uh, for the audience, uh, you might wonder what these four things have in question here in the picture on the screen. The New York Times, Twitter, the Bush family, and the US Federal Reserve. Uh, well, the answer is that Last week, these guys were all subject uh, to massive hacking uh, intrusions. And so it's a wide range of targets. And this is going on so frequently. We hear about it so frequently, we kind of get numb to and it. And it's interesting. It's a different people in each case. You know, right. We believe New York Times was, was, was Chinese. Uh, the Bush family right, was, uh, I think, politically motivated. Federal Reserve was, uh, was the anonymous group, so was some kind of political statement. Twitter, I don't know. Let's pretend it was a criminal. Right, you've got an array of different threats here. <laughs> so... So the paranoia is justified a little bit when we hear about the hackers, but let's turn to another subject, which is these Chinese intrusions, because we heard so much, like, coming out of Davos, we heard so many companies grumble, complain, and in some ways they were a little bit ashamed to admit that they have this problem, kind of a growing problem, that they're being hacked constantly. And it seems to be true. I mean, everyone's pretty much hacked constantly all the time. There's a lot of hacking coming out of China, yeah. uh, largely politically motivated. The attack against the New York Times uh, the attackers were looking for names of informants, right? a very political thing, presumably for government reprisal. Uh, we don't know if the attacks were done by the government, they were done by independent people working right. within China with nationalistic uh, right. so we'll use ideals. The word China. We don't know. It sounds like it's the government. There's no way to prove that allegation. It actually, there's no way to prove it's China. One oh, of the I problems see. we have is, is you don't know where attacks are coming from. You can't trace an attack backwards. Often when we know, we know from other channels. One of the things that's most chilling about that, that New York Times hack is that 
more than 50 computers were actually penetrated, and they stole all the passwords, which means that it's probably likely that some of those computers have a Trojan horse in them somewhere or a back door that's been opened up where they can come back in any time. Well, it's hard to tell. If you read the reports, and it, it turns out everyone gets hacked, but if you hack the New York Times, you end up with a 2,400-word newspaper article about it. So we know a lot about this. Okay. They say they, they caught it early, they let it go on for a couple of months to track exactly what was happening. They knew where all the back doors were, and they closed them. Were they perfect? We have no idea. They think they were, and, and they look like they did a good job. Mm. We don't know, but that certainly is a problem. Uh, the Wall Street Journal admitted they were hacked as well. And if the New York see, Times and Wall Street Journal, wow. you know there are going to be others. Yeah, that's true. A, some that might not have even realized it. And some companies couldn't really reveal that information. A newspaper can because it's, it's news for them. Well, but it's also embarrassing. In a yeah, lot of cases, if, if you're a bank, if you're a big company, you admit this, your stock price might go down, that's you right. might lose customers. That's right. So, yeah, customers worry, how, how safe is my data? How, safe, how much can I rely on this partner? Uh, now, some people characterize this as cyber warfare, and I've actually read where people, people say, we have a massive cyber war that's underway right now, and it's the U.S. versus China, but other countries are involved as well. Iran, sometimes they mention Israel or France. How serious do you think this, this cyber war concept is? Now, I think a cyber war is, is largely rhetoric. I mean, it's not war. We know what war looks like. Right. I mean, this is espionage. Yeah. It's, it's not a military action that involves guns and bombs and people dying. Uh, the cyber war rhetoric... I actually think is largely put in place by in the U.S. by government corporations that are profiting from it. Right? The U.S. Cyber Command announced oh, uh, last month that they're expanding from 900 people to about 5,000 people. Oh, so if we, we bang the drum of war, we can kind of stir up people and get support for a massive well, expansion. Because you think about, you know, we're really weird with war. We, we love to use the word war when there's no war. Right. War on terror, war on crime, war on drugs. That's we right. love rhetorical wars. We hate using the word war when there's an actual war. <laughs> we'll, use, we'll say anything else other than war. That's and, right. So, and this is so metaphorical war is accepted, it's but, politically acceptable. But what's going on here has kind of aspects of both. So yeah. it's, I mean, the war on drugs is clearly not a war. Right. These cyber attacks, well, you know, there's some kind of stuff going on that involves military. And it involves nations in some respect, and they're, and they're, they're, uh, they're spooks, you know, so yeah. in a way it is kind of a war, but I it's mean, like a shadow war. I mean, my fear is that we're in the early years of a cyber war arms race. That there's a lot, and not, and not just China, the U.S. too, uh, NATO, other countries, we're pouring a lot of money into cyber attack, cyber defense. It's a huge growth industry. That's true. And if you, if you think about... And the drumbeat gets louder every single day. You coined the term wholesale surveillance to describe the way governments are kind of hoovering up data. Uh, and in the U.S.'s case, it's frankly, because of the massive expansion of Homeland Security after 9-11. Let's take a look at, at wholesale surveillance by the numbers. So the first number I'm going to show you is 300. This is the number of times a citizen of the United Kingdom is, is videotaped on average every single day as they pass through the UK. There are about 5 million CCTV cameras in the UK. It's the most heavily surveyed country in the world. One third. This number represents the percentage of U.S. Air Force craft that are autonomous drones. Most people are unaware that we have 7,500 drone aircraft in the U.S. Air Force right now, and that number is increasing rapidly. And by the way, the Air Force isn't the only uh, government branch that has drone aircraft. We'll get into drones a bit more. But the number that struck me was 40. 40 is the number of attacks every single day by drones in Afghanistan. I was unaware of this until I started to put together the research for this show. So last year, on average, every day there were 40 drone attacks in Afghanistan. 76, this is the number of nations that are rapidly scrambling to get their own drone air force fleet. So soon the United States won't be the only country that has drone aircraft, and they're seeking to either develop the technology themselves or acquire it on the market. Now this big number, 878,000, that's a number of hours of audio that have been recorded in 2012 by the FBI in surveillance here in the United States. And this number, staggering 29 million electronic files that were gathered by the FBI last year in surveillance in the United States. So this is, the, some, in some respect, these numbers reflect the massive expansion of electronic surveillance that's happening right now. And to help us talk about this, let me introduce our next guest, uh, who comes to us from Washington, D.C. Folks, it's Julian Sanchez from the Cato Institute. Hi, welcome to the show. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. 
So Julian, you actually have been covering these topics on the web as part of your responsibility at the Cato Institute, but also as a journalist for some time. You're an expert in the subject of privacy and law and this electronic surveillance. As far as anyone can be. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a rapidly evolving topic. Um, one of the things we talked about earlier today, and we're getting ready, was the, the expansion really began after 9-11 we had kind of a state of emergency. And my observation is it's a permanent state of emergency. It doesn't seem like there's any end in sight. Well, that's right. It's not a conventional war where you beat the enemy and then they're gone. It's a, a war, in a sense, on a concept terror. And as long as there are angry young men somewhere who hate the United States, there'll be a, a justification for that threat. Right. As long as we keep lobbing in predator drones with Tomahawk missiles, we'll probably create a whole new generation of terrorists who wish to... We don't seem to be running out. Yeah, that's right. Now, um, well, tell me a little bit about Homeland Security, which really is a, it's a relatively new thing, but that's been the locus of this big government expansion. And what they really did was they combined a whole bunch of different uh, government departments together under one mandate. Uh, tell me a little bit about the growth of that and then some of the other organizations. Well, you know, that's one part of it. The part, the DHS uh, you know, gets a lot of attention. They're perhaps the most visible in, you know, in the form of TSA, the people who are groping you as you, you get on a plane. Um, it's really, though, I think not the biggest expansion of the surveillance state since 9-11. Uh, the problem is that a lot of this stuff happens below the surface. It's hard to get numbers, frankly, about uh, a lot of the, the activity that's going on. Ron Wyden, uh, the senator from uh, uh, Oregon, has been trying to get data from the National Security Agency about how many Americans they've got in their database, and they essentially refuse to provide even an estimate. They say they can't even provide a ballpark guess as to how many Americans are sitting in their database, and that's uh, a database that is enormous because they actually required them to build uh, a multi yottabyte data center in Utah to store the products of the 1.7 billion communications they're intercepting every day. A yottabyte, by the way, is about a quadrillion gigabytes. Uh, they don't actually have a higher <laughs> unit than that. <laughs> crazy. So one thing that's happening, we talked about this earlier, is that the price of storage has dropped so much that we can now do something that's totally unprecedented, which is store everything. Right. So in the past, if you were going to do surveillance or wiretapping, you had to be kind of selective about it because there wasn't a way to record it easily. But now they can, and they can also do analysis later, after the fact, to find out if there was any evidence of a crime or even a pattern that might suggest mm -hmm. illegal behavior. Well, I mean, this fundamentally changes how surveillance works. Right? Yeah. We used to, how we see it on television, follow that car. Yeah. Right? That's surveillance. That's right. But now it's follow every car. And actually, it's follow every car all the time, and we can follow that car six months ago because we've saved the data. Right. So surveillance changes. And it's, in a lot of ways, it's not because of malice. Computers produce data. Right. I mean, whenever you use your credit card, your cell phone, your computer, data about what you're doing and where is produced. That's right. And as data storage drops to free, as data processing drops to free, it's easy to save it. Why not save it then? And so you have companies saving it, like a Facebook, a Google, so they're saving it, governments are saving it, they're trading data. Right. Right? You know, uh, Google provides data to governments when asked under sometimes certain rules. Sometimes under subpoena, and sometimes not. Sometimes not, and, and often we don't know. I mean, uh, last month, a bunch of human rights uh, individuals asked politely Microsoft to tell them who they're letting spy on Skype video calls. Right, so we're asking did, nicely. Did they get an answer? We did not yet. Uh, this is one of the concerns. It's, uh, there's a growing world of surveillance. We know that a lot of it's happening. We know a lot of money's being spent. We don't know where. We don't know what they're recording. And, and we often have no choice. I mean, I like to think, you know, I, mean, I, don't, I don't like to think this, but it's sort of true that Google knows more about my interests than my wife does. Yeah. That's a little freaky. And they're able to predict better what you might do next because of the pattern. They can match your pattern against another cohort. And, and I've kind of never even met Google, let alone <laughs> gone out of it. Here's a question from Twitter. And the question is, minority report, how long until we can predict when people will commit crimes? So... How soon do you see that coming in the future? Well, I mean, well, what are we asking? How long before we can predict? Probably never. I mean, that's, I don't think those are things we can predict. How long before we're going to start using the ability <laughs> that we think we can predict? Well, right. we're doing it today. That's true. That's what the Raytheon I mean, Riot That's is. what the no-fly list is. Yeah, that's true. Well, we, we predict that you are so dangerous that you're not allowed to fly for any reason, yet so innocent we can't arrest you. It's kind of a weird mixed bag of people. So those things are coming, and I think they're going to become more and more. I think as technology gets more dangerous, as the things a bad guy can do increase, I mean, think about bioprinters, 
Right. Think about homemade. I mean, all the things we're scared of, homemade some nuclear of, weapons. Some of the topics we've right. covered on the show. As before. those things get scarier, the desire to stop someone before the fact. I mean, the only normal crime prevention is after the fact. Right? We, right. We're gonna, I'm going to let you murder the, somebody the gonna happen, and I'm just going right. to arrest you after the fact. Right. That only works if I can live with the murder rate. Right. But that's not going to work if you're able to print a pathogen that drops a species. So w- there will be an incredible push for this before the fact. Preemptive strike. Right. Which is the minority port yeah. type of future. And it's going to be lousy. It's not going to work. But people are going to want it. Arguably, that's what's going on in Yemen today. Right. right. So we now, last week... Signature strikes. Exactly. NBC released this, you know, this uh, purloined document from the, from the attorneys that basically gives Obama a permission slip to go ahead and assassinate American citizens off U.S. Mm-hmm. soil using a robot in the sky. Okay, so that occurred. What are they actually aiming for? They're not going for people who are in the process of conducting some sort of terrorist incident or building a bomb or something. They're targeting people who are at home. They're targeting people who are at a celebration, a wedding party or something. People who aren't actually doing anything necessarily criminal. It's the intent, the possibility, as you say, they're targeting them based on behavior and some measure right, of right. prediction. Well, so there, I mean, they're a moderately higher bar for American citizens. This is a, the strict uh, standard, right? Is they have to be uh, an imminent threat and capture is infeasible, except imminent, it turns out, doesn't really mean imminent because there doesn't have to be any kind of particular plot uh, that they know is ongoing. So imminent means something other than imminent uh, and capture being infeasible means I, I mean I think basically it would be easier to kill right. them inconvenient I think rather yeah. than infeasible um, now if, if you had the bad taste to be born somewhere other than the United States um, you know you don't even get that level of protection uh, again most of the drone strikes that are happening now are so-called signature strikes meaning it's not there's a particular person who's targeted but uh, you know five twenty year old uh, you know, uh, Arab males are congregated somewhere, uh, and well, that's either a terrorist plot or a wedding. But better be safe than sorry. Take him out. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about total information awareness. This program that Admiral Poindexter proposed more than a decade ago, but it, it, I thought it went away. But it seems maybe it's coming back. Right. I mean, the problem there was that they had terrible branding. They called <laughs> right. it Total Information Awareness, which sounds creepy. And then they had a logo that was like an eye in a pyramid with <laughs> beams coming down at the earth. So this sounded terrifying. Bill Sapphire wrote a column, you know, freaking out about it. Uh, everyone was duly alarmed. Congress nominally killed it. Uh, but it ended up getting essentially fragmented into a bunch of different programs that were farmed out to parts of DHS or DARPA. Uh, I think the NSA's uh, Pinwheel database is in some sense a, a, an offshoot of that. Pinwheel is, uh, again, on this model, a kind of a vast database that, that allows kind of Googling for communications. They've shifted from uh, that kind of targeted model, get a warrant, have an individual wiretap their conversations, much more toward a model that involves, some people have called it, sitting on the wire, suck in everything, and then after the fact, figure out the search parameters you're interested, go through, pull stuff up. And that's concerning, I think, because, you know, when J. Edgar Hoover ran the FBI uh, and, and was abusing surveillance for political purposes, at least he had to target particular people. You know, right. he's going to decide that Martin Luther King is going to be spied on and then they're going to try and drive him to suicide. Um, now, this stuff is sitting in a database for 30 years. If they happen to sweep you up and then in 10 years you're running for Congress, someone can, after the fact, decide right. you're worth scrutinizing. It's even conceivable that behavior that's legal today could change in the future and there'll be some record of it, and that could be embarrassing on the one hand, but it even might be that after the fact, it's illegal. Or, or even not. I mean, we, we, we all do things that are embarrassing because we're human. Yeah. I mean, you know, if everything is swept up, then... The likelihood the, of it being uncovered by somebody... And, and if you can selectively rare. edit it, I mean, we see this now in political campaigns. That's true. You know, now we're in living in a world where pretty much every candidate is followed 24-7 right. by the opposing party with a camera. Because they're going to say something that's embarrassing. And you got 10 seconds, and it's, it's a beautiful, embarrassing quote, and you run with they it. They run like crazy. We know one of, the, one of the things the intelligence agencies like to do with the fruits of surveillance information um, is use it to coerce people into becoming informants. You know, uh, the FBI now has 15,000 informants, like 10 times more than Hoover ever had at the peak of COINTELPRO, the kind of vast spying and infiltration network, uh, you know, looking at civil rights and anti-war groups. Uh, and one way to do that is to say, hey, we found out uh, that you're having an affair. Why don't you spy on your mosque for us? There was a case 
here in Chicago, and a good guy named uh, Ibrahim uh, uh, Mashal, I think. Uh, they said, look, we know that you had communications with a, a cleric in the Middle East. They were innocuous, but that's an, enough of a pretext to get someone put on the no-fly no list. If your business requires you to travel, that's a huge obstacle. And they said, well, we can get you off the no-fly list if you're willing to cooperate, if you're willing to tell us what people are saying at your mosque. And he's actually currently now suing the Justice Department over this. So the information is gathered up in this kind of broad sweep, sometimes without a warrant. And in any case, you know, warrants are targeted at an individual. Here we're taking information wholesale, as you put it, mm -hmm. hoovering it up, and then it's analyzed later. And then if something embarrassing, awkward emerges, now they've got leverage on somebody. It might not even be an illegal activity, as you point out, but it's leverage to coerce them mm -hmm. into cooperating with the government and doing the government's bidding. And this is our government. Now, I'm assuming that this is happening all around the world and probably in countries that don't have the same due process and constitutional rights and privileges that we have in this country. Um, and, and, I mean, it's certainly true, and we, we know that U.S. technology is being exported to totalitarian regimes for, for very, very purposes. Government of Syria, government of Egypt, government of Iran, we know those technologies are being used to identify people right. who, are, who are blogging, who are tweeting, anti-government. That's right. After the Arab Spring, sure. it's almost a, a certain bet that every authoritarian government now has a system in place to track those people who are outspoken, bloggers, right. tweeters, and so forth. Now, Bruce, I, I put this picture in for you. Uh, so why don't, we, why don't we go to this picture full, Ken, if we can show this to the audience. Uh, it says, premises protected by a false sense of security. You coined the term security theater. And tell me a little bit about that, because this is how most Americans experience the federal government most frequently now, is as we go through an airport, we get an encounter with a federal, federal official, right? I mean, it's actually amazing that for most of us, our, the way we interact with, uh, with national security is the TSA at airports. Yeah. So security theater is security that looks good but doesn't do anything. Now, so a great example is, I don't know if people remember, right after 9-11, if you were flying, you saw National Guard troops at airports. They were just at the security checkpoints. They were on a rubber mat. They had uniforms, carrying a big gun. They were like 20. I mean, they were kids. Uh, those guns had no bullets <laughs> because, I mean, right, they were kids. They would, they would, this would be dangerous. That's right, security theater. It looks good. It, it might make you feel better, but it's not going not gonna to do anything. Has, has the TSA program been effective? I mean... Are there that many people trying to smuggle weapons on airplanes? Are they going to repeat the same attacks of 9-11? You know, so it seems not. I mean, so, I, mean, I always think of the game this way, right? It's sort of us versus the terrorists. So we, we screen for guns and bombs, and the terrorists use box cutters. We take away box cutters, they put a, uh, they put a bomb in their shoes. We scream shoes, they use liquids. We limit liquids, uh, they put a bomb in their underwear. We have full body scanners. They're going to do something else, right. right? This is actually a dumb game. It is dumb game. Right? Wait, it's like shutting the gate after the horse is gone. I mean, so the smart game is you pick your attack, I pick my defense, and we see who wins. The dumb game is I pick my defense, you look at my defense, you pick your attack to bypass the defense. <laughs> and, and, right? So it seems that the TSA has largely been irrelevant. And they will talk about their, their success stories, and it's how many knives they take away and they find uh, they found somebody wearing a fake army uniform and they you know confiscated a snake I mean, th right. this stuff is actually on their website and they're proud of it they used to show some of the confiscated weapons in the early days but i think that's tapered off now because most people have learned don't bring a weapon or, or people do forget i mean people do bring that's guns true. on airplanes because they forget it's it, it is kind of weird you'd think <laughs> everyone would know by now but also, you know, people buy souvenirs and there's a, like a knife, a knife in the, yeah, in, in the wooden a statue opener. and they didn't yeah. realize it. That's true. You know, uh, new, uh, snow globes are now legal again. You couldn't bring snow globes on airplanes. We're not actually sure why, but now they're okay. So <laughs> we'll use snow globe collectors can... I mean, yeah. the, 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 and the sort of elephant not in the room here, right, is that there's just a limited number of terrorists. This is like a line of work where if you're really competent, you blow yourself up. It's a sort of <laughs> anti-Darwinian effect. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, what we find is that no one wants to admit this because there are hundreds of billions of dollars in, in grants from Homeland Security and then contracts for intelligence uh, contractors and defense contractors. Um, you know, but it increasingly looks like the FBI is being forced to manufacture terrorists so it can, uh, you know, give us a sense of success. And I think there's been about 150 uh, sting operations by the FBI that have resulted in convictions since uh, in the decade after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And at least a third of those cases, and maybe more, um, you know, these are cases where the weaponry, the, fine, the funding, and the actual plan 
all were provided by the FBI informant. These are mostly, again, you know, the world is full of young, angry people who spout off on the internet uh, and, you know, are easily led enough or mentally disturbed enough that if you give them a plan and a bomb, you know, they'll follow, they'll make the motions of following through. It's not clear that these are people who are otherwise dangerous. So in a way, we're, we're manufacturing our own terrorists just to give ourselves the illusion that this is an and effective that does program. And that does seem to be true. I mean, I mean, where there are successes is intelligence in operations. Where actually are looking at for the bad people. And when you look at something like uh, airport security, it only makes sense to focus on the plot, right? A, a liquid, a, a shoe bomb. If plots are few and targets are few. Right? If all we do by spending billions on shoe scanning is to force the terrorists to make a minor change in their tactic, right? we're wasting our money. Yeah, and we're and, wasting and everybody's time. And that's fundamentally the problem. Right. And it's, ma it's inefficient on a massive scale. Uh, speaking of inefficiency, these scanners that we're looking at, the rapid scans, mm -hmm. now I guess they're going to phase them out of the airports because they've been proven to be ineffective. After radiating us for a couple of years, now they're finding out that doesn't actually thwart any kind of uh, criminal activity. And because some of these uh, makers of these things fell through on, con on contracts that were supposed to allow them to use a blob uh, to show objects instead of sh actually showing you naked, but there's a bit of poetic justice. They're apparently being repurposed uh, at the entrances to various federal agencies. So, <laughs> right, they're actually not Fair going away. That, that's important. That's and, and, and all the full body scanners aren't going away. There are several technologies. Yeah. And the millimeter wave is staying, so oh, you know, see. holding your hands up and, and being scanned oh, is staying. not going away. Oh. Just a particular radiation technology, because the one company wasn't able to do some of their anonymization uh, things on the visuals, yeah. what Julian said. Well, and there was a case in Florida where some of those images did leak out, and oh, yes. that also sure. undermined the claim that somehow this information would never get out in the web. And you know, here we have the pictures right here, so you can see them. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, now let's try to take us down to the local scale. And mm -hmm. so, you know, as it turns out, it, it isn't just our federal government that's out there combating terrorists or maybe other nations, we don't really know, in some shadowy cyber war. Uh, but actually, in a weird way, the, I think the DHS has kind of co-opted your local police force. They've turned them into deputies of this national effort to find, uh, find terrorists. Talk a little bit about the spread of homeland security dollars to local police forces. Well, so I, mean, I think we'll maybe get to fusion centers in more detail later, but yeah, there's lots of federal money out there. If you say you want to run a counter-terror program, you may not have terrorists, but that's no reason to turn down the money. money. <laughs> right. um, you know, so we find so fusion centers, for example, something like $250 billion in grants that went out, um, you know, supposedly for counter-terror. A two-year Senate investigation found that they never actually produced a single shred of actionable, useful intelligence about terrorism. It did end up buying a lot of Range Rovers for local, local sheriff's departments, plasma uh, TVs so that they could display the Fusion Center calendar and watch cable news in, uh, in San Diego. DHS has given out, I think, $50 million mm -hmm. in grants for local police departments to photograph license plates, it, to your well, point earlier, in, in, in a wholesale level. You know, not going after an individual car or doing it as they drive by on patrol, but they're setting up cameras now at different locations. I know in San Diego they're doing this on a massive scale. They're just routinely photographing mm -hmm. the license plate of every car on the freeway that goes but by. It's a lot of technology. It's license plates. Uh, it, it's all the CCTV cameras. You produce the, uh, the UK number we know better. There's, there's cameras everywhere in the United States also. That's right. You know, a, a lot of cities have them in intersections where they're automatically scooping up camera uh, license plates, again, that's being saved. Uh, the money's being used for other surveillance, for uh, cell phone surveillance, for just collecting up lots of data. And we'll get into cell phones in a minute. But because it's data, yeah. it sloshes around. I mean, this that's is the right. fundamental problem. It doesn't matter yeah. who collects it. Once it's in the system, it goes into a fusion center, it goes into the NSA's computers, it goes into some uh, marketing computer, and th the data stays, and what, it's very hard to get rid of it. And now it's being used for all sorts of purposes, and, and we have no control over it, or really even any visibility into what data we don't is collected. Know, yeah. We don't know how it's being used or who's using it. We also don't know when it's going to come back to haunt us, because it may turn out a few years later something that you did was of interest to them, and they may have been tracking you for quite some time. You're probably taping this show. <laughs> I'm sure we are. <laughs> so, so there are... Um, billions at stake, and it's a rapidly growing business. Uh, we know now that the surveillance business itself, just that segment of it, is now something like a $5 billion business outside of government to, to private corporations. I thought it might be nice to take a look at the snooper market, take a look at uh, all the devices, some of the devices that are on sale. Uh, for instance, the watch hound, which allows, people, allows police forces to listen to 
uh, cell phone conversations the same way you might if you were using, say, a radio band scanner. So you can actually tune in to the cell phone conversations. You, you probably didn't think that people could hear you when you're talking on your cell phone. In fact, that's widely available. These are widely in use. Uh, the Stingray. Stingray, this is an interesting device. It can be mounted uh, in a van, in a police van, and driven around a neighborhood. And if they're trying to find a particular individual, even if that individual is not using his cell phone, what it does, uh, the Stingray pretends to be a cell phone tower, and so it'll find that phone, connect with it, and then they can drive a few more blocks and eventually triangulate the location of that particular phone. So they can find you with your phone. In a weird way, your cell phone is like a little spy that's in your pocket leaking out information about you. And then Cellbrite. This is one that troubles me the most. So for uh, a routine traffic incident, moving vehicle violation, you can be pulled over by a policeman. And if you have your cell phone on your body or if you're using it when they pull you over, then they have the right to take your cell phone and they plug it into this thing, Cellbrite, and in just about two minutes, it can download everything that's on your phone. Now think about that. That technology is actually accessing my whole life in my cell phone. I, you're with the Cato Institute. At this point, I need to disclose that the Cato Institute is known as a libertarian organization, <laughs> a libertarian think tank. What's your take on this device, this Cellbrite? I mean, are you yeah. outraged by this? This is a little bit of an intrusion. Yeah. I think it's, uh, the question, of course, is whether this is actually something that happens routinely. We don't know what a court would say about a situation like this, but certainly the setup is there. The Supreme Court has held that it's not just, you know, felonies that a police officer can arrest you for. It's any crime, including not having your seatbelt buckled or a traffic violation. It's up to their discretion whether to perform an arrest. And then once they've decided to arrest you, there's a Fourth Amendment exemption for searches incident to arrest. It's certainly not beyond the realm of possibility that they could decide that that is covered within the scope of a search incident to arrest uh, and effectively use a pretextual stop to gather a full record of your electronic life. I've also heard that um, when you enter the U.S., sometimes right. Customs and Border yeah. and Security will do the same with laptop, computers, cell phones, mm -hmm. and so forth. And usually, you're right, it's for an individual of interest to them, uh, not necessarily a suspect, but it might be someone we know of documentary filmmakers yeah. and volunteers sure. who work on organizations, uh, you know, even people affiliated with Aaron Swartz. I have sure. been detained right. in this okay. way and seen their electronics moved down. Well, and, and the privacy watchdog at DHS actually just issued a, a finding that suspicionless searches of laptops and other le electronic devices uh, basically should be allowed to continue. No reasonable suspicion of any kind is necessary. Uh, and they, they concluded bizarrely that there would be no civil liberties benefit to curtailing these searches at the border. And, and border search here is sort of a term of art. Uh, it's also their view that the sort of constitution-free zone extends for about 100 miles in from the border. And the Constitution free zone. Not a phrase I'd heard before. Remember, so. This is all temporary. I mean, so what's the outrage here? That my phone has my email, my contacts, my calendar, my life. Potentially my credit card information but, could be stored. But, but, but think about what's really happening. I have a smartphone. It's probably that Google has my right. email, right. my calendar, well, that's true. my contacts. Right. It's, it's just in a convenient cell phone shaped package for me to carry around with me. You're right. If the police wanted it, they could just go, they get, could it. go get it elsewhere. That's true. I mean, so data is moving around. It, That's when a really good point. One of the problems with these debates is we always focus on one thing. We focus on cameras, focus on cell phones, we focus on CCTV. Whereas the problem is everything put together. Right? It's not drones, it's drones with cameras. It's not drones right. with cameras. It's drones with cameras and face recognition, right. the ability to track between different drones and day-to-day, -day, tie that back to databases so you can see in real time from a drone everybody's name and income level as they walk around town. Is a terrifying in, 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 a, in a way, getting your data from the phone is super inefficient because, <laughs> one, the person knows that you've done it, probably. They see you, you know, plugging their phone into something. Uh, and, you know, you, can, you have to own get one person at a time's data. What a, you know, what a drag. Um, unfortunately, since a, a series of sort of misguided rulings from the late 70s, um, Fourth Amendment doctrine is that once your data is in third-party hands, once it's right. Google or Facebook holding on to it, uh, in, in principle, that's now their business records. You've surrendered your Fourth Amendment privacy interest. And so a lot of that data that we naturally expect to be protected by the Fourth Amendment's requirement of a warrant issued by a judge isn't protected in that way and can right. be gained without People are without totally a unaware of that. That, that right. actually pertains to your Gmail account, for instance, right. which is stored on Google servers or any other but uh, that, but, but pretty much everything these days. Right. Cloud computing, we have our pictures somewhere, our emails somewhere, all of our data is very rarely on our devices That's now. Really it's, it's really elsewhere. Because it makes a lot of sense. But now, 
As Julian said, the rules no longer apply that right. protect them. In a weird way, our protections, our First Amendment, Fourth Amendment protections haven't really caught up with the 21st century. Not even close. And the technology is evolving much faster than laws ever will. Let's bring it right back home here in, in Illinois. You may, you were shooting the show here in Chicago, and you may be unaware that right here in Illinois, there are 91 organizations working on counterterrorism efforts. And what's interesting about that number of 91 is that more than three quarters of them didn't exist before 9-11. So these are brand new organizations that are involved in some way or another in surveillance. That's why we call it Illinois, the, the land of surveillance. Welcome to this place. What we happen to have here is two fusion centers. You talked a little bit about these. Here's a really ugly diagram uh, from the government. It's non-confidential, so it's been released for us to show to you tonight. And um, tell me a little bit more about these fusion centers. In your, your view, they haven't been very effective. Right. Well, in, in the view of, uh, of a bipartisan uh, report that the Senate put out, uh, you know, despite years of being assured that these were a proven vital tool. The theory was you synthesize information from local law enforcement, lots of different agencies, bring that together with information uh, at the federal level, information that you know, various intelligence agencies have gathered, uh, and this will give you a, a better window into incipient terrorist groups. Of course, you know, right after 9-11, we assumed there had to be lots of other sleeper cells waiting to strike, uh, and it, again, it seems to be th that's not the case. Uh, and so you've got a lot of people looking for something that doesn't appear to be there. Uh, the sort of history of intelligence suggests that, unfortunately, the problem is if the, if the thing that you are convinced is there isn't there, you just keep looking harder. <laughs> it's true. And redouble your efforts and argue in the future, we need more resources to go after this. <laughs> you know, one of the funny ironies that I think, I think has emerged here uh, is a statement that actually was made by Julian Assange. And we, we put on this picture here, we, we got this picture from the web, but it's actually worth zooming into. So if we can put this on screen for the folks at home. Uh, you have, here you have Julian Assange of WikiLeaks, and he's saying, I give private information to the public for free, and I'm a villain. Meanwhile, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, well, he's taking your personal information, and he's providing it to private enterprise for, for money, and he's the man of the year. Your take on this is slightly different, I think. You're not, you're not going to go with this parody 100%. Well, it's funnier than it is true. I mean, I mean right. just sort of for, for, for reasons of, of greed, basically, Zuckerberg w wants to keep your information, so the corporations have to keep coming back to him to target their ads. You give out all that information, they don't need you. But as these, bad, these companies, as and it's not just Facebook, it's also Google, it's also yeah. Apple, they're subject to literally thousands of subpoenas and, and these really creepy national security right. letters. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of people are unaware of what an NSL actually is. So national security letters, uh, they're a tool that existed in a much more limited form before 9-11, were in a series of stages expanded. They allow uh, FBI agents, basically the head of any one of 52 uh, FBI field offices, to authorize without judicial uh, supervision or approval uh, the seizure basically of non-content telecommunications records and uh, financial records, and financial records now has been expanded to mean any record from anyone that uses money, essentially. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, Obama, when he was campaigning, said he wanted to do away with these. He wanted to do away with national security letters being used to seize sensitive information about people who are not even suspected of a crime. They're really used in a kind of six degrees of separation way to say, well, we have one target, let's look at everyone they're friends with, and let's look at who they're emailing and what websites they're visiting um, so we can get a kind of social graph or pattern out of it. Uh, actually, in 2010, the Obama administration broke Bush's record for the number issued. It was about yeah. 26,000, mm -hmm. uh, only this is a staggering pertaining number. to Americans. And the number of people affected, it was more than 14,000. Again, that's only Americans, and it doesn't include national security letters for basic information, like, you know, who is associated with a certain IP address. So this is only more detailed transactional logs. So there's no getting. warrant, there's no judge involved, right. there's no yeah. secret court that you have to go to. You don't have to show any evidence. In fact, you can use these to troll for evidence and then mm -hmm. go back to the court and say, well, now we've got the evidence we were looking for thanks to the NSL. And now please give us the warrant so we can go after right. these people. And there's yeah. a, lot, there's a well, lot of belief that's happening. And, and to Google's credit, they will tell, say quarterly, how much of these they're getting. I mean, they right. they, they'll tell us. They don't give us details. Twitter has also pushed back, right. right? And even some telcos have, right. not our very big ones. They seem to have kind yeah. of been co-opted by the right. government. I mean, a lot of companies will not tell us at all yeah. 
how many of them they get, whether they comply, nice. how much they comply. It is all very secret. Google and Twitter are rare in sort of volunteering some of this information about how much they get. There's no aggregate reporting as there is with wiretaps that would give us a kind of overall picture of how much these different electronic surveillance tools are used. Uh, the telcos normally are not so forthcoming, but uh, Congressman Ed Markey sort of requested the major cell phone carriers to give a tally of how many requests from different kinds of law enforcement agencies they got, uh, added up to about 1.3 million a year. Wow. Uh, a lot of that is cell phone tracking, a lot of that is calling patterns. Also, just the compliance with that, think of those number of requests. Mm -hmm. I'm certain that the person receiving those requests at that volume would just automate the process and yep. not even pay attention. They well, just Sprint has done that. Uh, they created a, a back-end called L-Site because they said, we're getting so many requests, we just couldn't deal with them Help manually yourself. anymore. It's like the information smorgasbord. Right. They allow them to just dial straight in. We've heard rumors about that, too, with some of the other social networking mm -hmm. sites. Kind of a creepy thought. One question here, it comes in, have you developed your own ways to combat or accept this new world order of constant surveillance? So I guess the question pertains to you guys. What do you do in your own lives to keep your lives private and secret? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, what we do is around the edges. Right. You, what can you do? You can not have a credit card, you can not have a cell phone, you can not go outside, you can live in a cave. I mean, they kind of make no sense. You know, I don't have a Facebook account. That right. makes me kind of a freak. I, I keep mm -hmm. all my email on my computer. That makes me a double freak. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I mean, I'm doing some things around the edges, mm -hmm. but by and large, there's not a lot we can do. I mean, you, you have to accept it simply because you're being surveilled. What we learned from the General Petraeus scandal is that he, even the director of the CIA can't keep email secret. Right. I mean, if he can't do it, I don't stand a chance. You know, that actually, that is a very troubling case, isn't it? That, that Gmail hacking, it's a major intrusion. Not, not just the fact that it was kind of a comedy of errors with our two generals and they're <laughs> flirting with this woman in Florida and so forth. That, that was funny and it had a comic element to it. But in fact, this Gmail hacking by the FBI with really no pretext, no right. evidence of criminality, right. and they trolled through until they found some evidence of something that they could hold him accountable I mean, for. It's bizarre on a couple of levels. It nominally started as uh, an investigation into cyber stalking, meaning she'd sent some harassing, uh, Paula Broadwell had sent some harassing emails to a, a woman who was friends with Petraeus. Um, this is not normally the kind of thing the FBI would right. really involve itself in at all. Um, Having tracked these emails back to Broadwell, because again, you're never private, she had used an anonymous Gmail account, but then logged in from the same IP address to her real Gmail account. Even if you're using stuff like something like Tor, usually the IP address is persistent over time. So if you log into anything that's connected to you uh, within that window, you can be traced back again. They can, they can link those two things. And then having figured out who sent the emails, if that was a, they decided, I think, ultimately that actually the emails didn't rise to the level of criminal harassment, right. but having identified who sent them, instead of then confronting Broadwell, they decided to do a phishing expedition through all of her email. Right. Uh, and it's not clear what conceivable connection that had right. to the thing that they were supposed to be investigating. So at that point, the, the supervisors, when they found no evidence of criminality, they should have called, called the investigation off, and they didn't. That seems like a real breach. Right. We'll probably hear more about that story. I need to move on. I'm loving the conversation, but we have to get into what's next. So on this show, we like to talk about what's now and what's next and then what comes next. The next things we're going to talk about are drones, phones, and super cookies. And these, it gets creepier, folks. So check this out. Predator drone, you're familiar with these. They've been in use since 2001. There's one on display at the National Air and Science Museum, so they're already kind of a part of American history. Massive expansion to that program. But as Bruce mentioned just a minute ago, uh, the scientists from DARPA has been experimenting with different ways to modify these. And there's all sorts of new, weird versions of drones that will be coming out in the near future. One of them is called Argus. And what they've done is they've taken 368 of those cell phone cameras, the camera, the 5 or 10 megapixel camera that's on your cell phone today, and they've assembled those into sort of a beach ball shape uh, uh, mounting. And they can put that at the front of one of these drones. And this Argus program then allows that drone to hover over a particular place and record everything that's happening on the ground. Now the device itself, the, the drone itself, has literally millions of terabytes of uh, storage on board, but they're also streaming that data out down to the ground. And so in real time, someone who's back in the base station can see an image kind of like this. It's a composite image of all those different eyes in the sky, and they can start to see what's happening on the ground. But what's even more troubling, because of the degree of accuracy in each of those cameras, is that they can zoom in. And they can actually, today, get to a level of detail that allows them to see from 14,000 feet in the air 
a six-inch long object. They can also, using gait analysis technology, face recognition, some of the other technologies you mentioned, they can actually start to identify the people on the ground. Today, these technologies are being used in Afghanistan to, to fight the war there. Tomorrow, those drones will be in the United States. It seems to me a near certainty. More than 358 different uh, law enforcement groups and counterterrorism groups in the United States have asked the FAA for permission to start to fly their own autonomous drone, unit, drone units, and we can expect those to be mounted with similar surveillance right. technology. This is clearly coming. Now, when we chatted about this, you, you gave what was a really chilling prediction to me, which is that basically you're like, it's here. It's happening. Yeah, I mean, I mean coming seems like an overstatement. <laughs> we, we, we used drones this week to uh, hunt down that uh, California cop killer who was holed up in, in, in his mountain hideout. Right. And there are, they're being used in cities. That's right. right. I think the, we have the, a picture here of uh, the... Um, well, these are some of the cheap ones that are coming. But here we have the Border Patrol. Right. And they're used, they, they have 10. They have a fleet of 10, and they've asked for 14 more. So you're right. It's already here. It's not really out in the future. I mean, what's coming is... I mean, what's, what's coming next? Right? They, they're going to get better at resolution. Right. They will be able to read documents, be able to better identify faces. And once you identify faces, I mean, you have a lot of good public face databases. I mean, Facebook yeah. has a phenomenal database of tagged photos. Thanks to your friends who tagged you, you'll even now be identified the, by the drone right, in the sky when you leave the house. Even if you're not on Facebook. I mean, it's not like you're their customer. Right? I don't have a Facebook account. There are tagged photos of me on Facebook. They oh, have really a telling. network of my friends there because they'll pull people's cal uh, address books. So five years out, what do you expect to be the case? There'll be drones in every city. Uh, there will be, so my, my expectation is that there will be drones everywhere 24-7. I mean, it's not going to make sense for companies to fly their own drone fleets. There's going to be you know, drones over America, Inc., and they'll have drones everywhere, and you know, like Google Street View, it'll be drone sky view so real like time, a, and, and you just rent time on it. You get right. what you want. Like a backbone internet provider, you'll just lease capacity on the drone. Be because it, cause so that's, 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 that's surveillance smart, for hire. <laughs> but that's a smart way to do it. And you already have that now with satellites. So if you're a company that, right. I'm making this up, wants to sell lawn care products, you can get, uh, you can get a map, you can overlay it with addresses, so you have you know, crappy lawns, so you now can call them. Yeah. So it's all the data being collected and overlaid with other data. So yeah, we can yeah, identify yeah. people, we can collect it, market with databases, uh, we can uh, collect, integrate it with cell phone data, which as you mentioned is location data, and also data about who you're interacting with. And now, whether you're a government or a corporation, you can collect people who aren't your customers, for everybody, a lot of data about them, which allows you to market to them. That's true. And for, for commercial purposes, there's many good uses, right? Real estate, people want to understand where traffic patterns are going. Retailers want to see how well, much foot traffic and car traffic There are weird uses, by. right? I mean, there's a lot being talked about now about personalized billboards, that a billboard will see you walk by. Now they can recognize your gender really quickly and they can give you an ad that you might like better. Wow. But if they now know you by name, the same ad now follows you around town. That is... And then onto Facebook and onto Google, and it gets really weird. It sounds like science fiction. So for one of the things you're leading up to, you've already foreshadowed a little bit, is the combination of these eyes in the sky, and frankly, eyes everywhere. Every building will have cameras on and so forth. All that information now is going to be networked. Previously, the CCTV cameras weren't networked, mm -hmm. but now they're networked. And we can cross-reference that with your location data. So your phone in your pocket, as I said earlier, it's a spy. It's really like little brother is watching you. You're carrying little brother around with you. That's leading us into this wonderful new world of behavior tracking. This is the white-hot center of online advertising at this point. It's the hottest field for online marketing where we can actually kind of predict patterns of behavior, predict who we can market to next, some of the things you were just alluding to. Tell me a little bit about Super Cookies. Here we've got a goofy picture of Super Cookies, but this is actually kind of a creepy new development in browser technology. Well, I'm so the idea is that you know, people have started to catch on it. Some of them have at right. least. Right, it's actually that. not that new. Right, oh, <laughs> that's true. Uh, you clear out your cookies so you can't be tracked yeah, online. Yeah, that, you clear But it turns out there's a the lot cookies. of other ways you can do that. There are plugins like Flash that uh, allow separately data to be stored that can be used for tracking purposes. And there's stuff like browser fingerprinting. Your browser sends a lot of information about how your system is configured, and it turns out that very often that's enough to uniquely identify you, the sort of precise combination of different Just search system history, settings. the websites that you no, visit. No, so even like the fonts on your computer. I mean, computers oh tend to have fingerprints that uniquely identify them. You know, what we're, we're really learning is, and it's, it's worse on something like a smartphone, 
that it's really, really hard, probably impossible to not be tracked. Mm -hmm. That even if you do all the things right, enough happens around you that the data is being collected. Right. And then, of course, once it's collected, it you, 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 you don't know where it goes. Right. It's, a, it's the future of advertising. Uh, even, even the Magic Kingdom is using a kind of technology. This is an example from Disneyland where your family can have a, a RFID bracelet, a little, um, a little radio frequency tag bracelet that they can wear so your kids can run around Disneyland and you can kind of identify them. But that's not the only people who are watching. It turns out Disneyland loves this because they can now track traffic flows within the theme park and they can see if you're spending more time in Tomorrowland than Frontierland and so forth. Um, they also know if dad is spending time drinking a beer uh, while his kids are on the rides. Uh, it also means that the different Disney characters can greet you by name because they'll see your name on some device that they're holding and they can actually say hello, which for parents who've taught their kids not to talk to strangers who address them by name, this starts to create kind of a weird situation. And I, just, I don't way, know if not to talk to strangers applies to giant ferrets. <laughs> That's right. right. Cinderella. Yeah, right. But not really a stranger. You know, my feeling is that this type of technology seems innocuous. Oh, come on, it's Disney. How bad could it be? I think the problem for this is when you have a six-year-old kid running around with an RFID tag, what you're really doing is conditioning them to submit to this level of surveillance. And you're just getting them used to the idea that everything they do is going to be tracked. And, and we see it also in schools. I mean, schools are now getting a lot of these things. And they're often being given to schools for that reason. It acclimates people. So whether it's face recognition technology or fingerprint technology on buses, I mean, this is all being sold as. So bi biometrics right, is also a part. Schools of it. are very dangerous. There's there's shootings every day. Your kid has a one in two chance of dying in a shooting. You know, whatever state, you know, whatever our fears are, they're being sold to us to uh, to mollify them. And it does it does get kids used to this sort of a ubiquitous surveillance that it's normal. I mean, this is one of the the, the things that the TSA security theater actually is effective at. Uh, I mean, if you think about the the opening scenes of that George Clooney movie, Up in the Air, where he's just absolutely seamlessly, almost ballet-like, you know, uh, <laughs> whipping his laptop out, sliding his shoes off. I mean, it's all this sort of choreographed dance, and, and it reminds me of, of uh, this idea that of the French philosopher Michel Foucault talked about, that there's forms of surveillance that create docile bodies, They that by being observed, that we are trained to follow the path of, of least resistance, which is to say, train ourselves to automatically go through the procedures that expose us to the TSA guy with the least amount of hassle. I mean, they, they, they do a good job of, of encouraging this, right? Well, you don't have to go through the naked scanner. You can instead get terribly groped. Well, no, the easier thing to do is submit to the naked the scanner. Yeah. And it's a form of training. That's true. I think that's very true. You know, I, I was a young man. I had the opportunity to live in Berlin. And I spent time in East Berlin and East Germany and elsewhere in the, in the East Bloc. And this was the one thing I took away from that experience, is when you live under constant surveillance and you don't know who's working for the government, they, they all might be spies, you never really know, people become apathetic and they stop mm -hmm. trying. Well, but also, you change. I mean, I, I remember in the years of 9-11, I'll be talking to a friend on the phone, and we say something because we're talking about security, and one of us says, wow, I hope the NSA isn't listening. We both laugh because it's a funny joke, but you know, the conversation changes. That's yeah. true. The fact that you might be observed in all things mm -hmm. changes how you act. It makes you less of a free person. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's probably less crime in East Berlin, but you didn't want to live there. You sure didn't want to live there. One of, one of the sadder things I remember reading in, in the New York Times reporting on the NYPD's sort of Muslim infiltration program was uh, there was a student union at, I think, Columbia or another New York university where uh, they had posted in the room where the Student Muslim Association met a sign saying, please do not discuss current controversial politics in this room. We don't want trouble. Uh, and that doesn't seem like a healthy environment <laughs> right, for that, a free society. A right. Please keep your free thinking at home. Don't bring it here. And, and, and unfortunately, you don't know these things. So they're Freedoms are hard to value. You right. only value them when they're missing. When they're gone. That's really true. And, and more than a decade ago, Phil Zimmerman, the creator of Pretty Good Privacy, he said he, he likened personal privacy to the environment. He said there's going to be a time where it, it becomes kind of a privilege for a certain group of people right. who can mm -hmm. afford to have it, have access to it. Okay, so that's pretty scary and pretty depressing. I don't want to end on a dark note like that. I guess the question is, what can we do? What are some of the things we can do? Now, we had some encouraging news, perhaps. Uh, the mayor of Seattle recently decreed that there will be no drone surveillance in the city of Seattle. Perhaps that'll start to roll out on a local level. More cities might follow. 
Uh, some people are starting to hack together their own way to avoid, uh, to avoid police surveillance. Here's a kind of homemade version of a, of a license plate scanner avoider. Um, and when it comes to face recognition and face tagging, uh, there's an artist in, in the UK who created a series of makeups that you can purchase. And if you put these makeups on, they look a little funny, but what you can see in the picture here is it makes it difficult for a computer to recognize your face as a face because it actually distorts the image for the computer. Who knows? Maybe in the future you'll see some people walking around with that or some kind of tattoo. That artist is Adam Harvey. He's actually introduced a fashion line, uh, which we have here and we'll, do, we'll show a little bit later on. Marley's got a few of them over there. Here are a couple examples of these. Um, it's a little fanciful, maybe a little hypothetical at this point, um, but these are garments designed to help you protect yourself uh, from surveillance cameras, from uh, thermal scanners and from sur surveillance cameras. And you can see they might even have a chance of bringing the burqa back into style here in the Western world. One thing actually that they sent over I thought was probably had some use to it, which is this bag. Uh, it's a little, a little case for your cell phone, and when your cell phone is inside of it, it doesn't emit any signal, no signal can get in, nobody can track it. Well, of course, no, are... nobody can call you either. That's so true. Be... It's like, you could just turn off your cell phone and save $100. <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about this act. So this is, well, this is an act that was proposed by Rand Paul oh, yes. of Texas, right? This is the Preserving Freedom from Unwarranted Surveillance Act. It's a big title, but actually kind of a neat principle. Yeah, I mean, the only possible member of Congress who, who I could ever say might go a little further than I actually would is, is Rand Paul. Um, this was, the idea here was to require a warrant, a full-blown Fourth Amendment probable cause warrant, any time law enforcement or intelligence wants records about you from a third party like Google or Facebook. Um, not just the contents of communications. Federal law sometimes allows those to be gotten without a search warrant, although courts are increasingly saying the Fourth Amendment requires it. He wanted to say all records, your IP logs, your basic subscriber information, everything would require a full-blown warrant. That seems like a little much. I mean, they need something that they can get first so they can build the evidence they need to, to go to a judge for a warrant. Um, but it's actually a very hard question where to draw those lines. What is sensitive information? Because even something like an IP address or you know, email headers can reveal stuff about your political associations, which the Supreme Court has said uh, is, 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 can, is protected under certain circumstances. You can't force a controversial political organization like the NAACP to reveal who their members are to the government. That's a pretty, that's a pretty but, tall order. But, but unfortunately, that, right, this bill died, died in committee, yes. right? I mean, it, that's and, 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 I mean right. the bill and all of the technologies you talked about, if you think about it, they're really around the edges. When you think about what we can do, the unfortunate answer is kind of not much. And there's, the, mm -hmm. These now things there's are happening. A, there's a drone lobby. There's now a big surveillance there's, technology I mean, lobby. I, I, mean, I and, think what we can do is what we're doing here. We need to right, talk about talk the about issues. It. We need I to make agree. people aware of them. And we need to agitate. I mean, this is going to require real social and political change. You know, we're not up for it now. I the hope agree. is that... that we will be eventually. I, I, I should, agree with you. Note that the Paul bill was one of several that got shot down as the FISA Amendments Act, which empowers the NSA, was reauthorized. A lot of this stuff was a lot milder. So a proposal that the NSA has to make an estimate of how many Americans are being swept into its database, shot down. A proposal that uh, before, you know, if they're doing foreign collection and they sweep up Americans and they want to search for a particular American, they need a search warrant for that, shot down. Uh, it's It's... Sort of troubling how little will who's, there who's is. Who's doing for the shooting down? Like, who are everybody, these senators? Everybody is. Everybody. It, it, it's not everybody, anybody in particular. Bipartisanism yeah. is alive in Washington. Oh, if, when it comes to stopping legislation, more, yes. the, 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 pro, the problem is there isn't the political. I mean, if you think about who won, you've got to go against the police, you're going to go against national security, you're going to go against corporate lobby. There's not a lot of power arrayed against these things. And that's yeah. why this is hard. It's a giant issue. Well, it's time for me to start to bring the show to a wind down now. Uh, we will have an open Q&A afterwards. I hope you'll stick around for that. But now it's time for me to talk about what's next after what's next. And folks, it's simple. You face a difficult choice ahead. We have to decide what kind of society we want to live in in this country. A, a society where we can expect a reasonable degree of privacy or a society where transparency is forced upon us without any possibility of resisting it. That's a decision we're going to have to make. We do have the ability to hold our elected representatives accountable. We do have the ability to speak up and object when corporations impose some transparency or on a forced surveillance upon us that we don't wish to have. And we have the ability to speak up. So it is forums like these that give us the opportunity to have that kind of an exchange. 
Well, I want to thank you both. Bruce Schneier, thank, thank you, you for joining me on the show tonight. Julian Sanchez of the Cato Institute, thank you. Be sure to check out Bruce's book, Liars and Outliers. I want to give a big shout out to the crew here at Live Lab. And Barry, thank you very much for making this show possible. It's been a pleasure doing the show with you. And a big, big shout out to our live band led by Paul Wordico. Strike it up, Paul. Let's hear it.